So please do buy an apartment or a house in Berlin. Right. Ryan, let's start, ladies first, with you. Um, Ryan, in 2004, you basically started writing or working on the first script. And since then, you know, Deadpool 1 has become a huge success. Uh, fans all over the world are completely excited. And now you're promoting Deadpool 2. How would you describe that journey since then? Uh, kind of crazy. I mean, you know, just to be attached to something for that long uh, and then to see it made sort of on a fast track was odd. I mean, we were, I was pushing that thing for 11 years and to no avail. And then uh, uh, we shot a little bit of test footage that sat on the shelf for a couple more years. The studio didn't have any interest in making the movie. Uh, and then that, that, that test footage unfortunately leaked out of the internet, and uh, which was really trash. And there, we're looking into that right now still. Uh, and then the, it was the internet. It was the the fans of the IP of Deadpool that got that movie made. Um, so next, next thing you know, we were standing on a film set, and that was like a dream come true for us. So our expectations were literally nothing, and they went, you know, it went. It was like a, a just went through the roof immediately. So by uh, by the time we were shooting Deadpool one. We had actually already started cracking the story on Deadpool 2, but not because we had the audacity to think that we would be able to shoot a Deadpool 2, because we had no idea at the time that 
Deadpool 1 would do so well. Um, we, we just love Deadpool. I mean, myself, Brett Reese, Paul Wernick, have, uh, each of us have been working together for almost a decade now, and we're sort of like brothers. And we were just cracking Deadpool stories just for fun. Um, and then, of course, the movie just blew up, the first one, and then we got to make this story, and we really wanted to tell a family film. We wanted Deadpool 2 to be a family film. Um, with a few fucks and shits thrown in for good measure, because kids need to grow up fast. <laughs> yeah. So it's been an interesting journey. What about you, Zazie? I mean, uh, you know, stepping on set, knowing that you have to basically stand up as Domino to Deadpool, uh, and you did it, uh, was there like a pivotal moment when you actually thought, okay, I can do this, I can improvise, I can stand up to uh, Ryan and his jokes and everything that's happening on set? Um, oh, sorry, wow. Um, yeah, I mean, I think what um, Ryan and Dave, I think, did a good job of is also sort of setting the example of like, playing around is okay and, um, I think, you know, that's, that is always very important to sort of have that trickle-down effect. Um, and, you know, it was, it was just, it was a super supportive environment and I, and I think it um, allowed us all to kind of like relax and just have a good time. So, I mean, I did obviously, um, I wanted to do the best that I could and, um, you know, I, I gave myself that pressure, but um, I, I think, all of us working together, we all just wanted to make um, the best that we could. And um, if I was lacking of a joke, Ryan would provide. Oh. <laughs> For all of us. For all of us, yeah. Actually, Zazie, you could have answered that question in German, but because we have a lot of international guests here, I think you're gonna stick to, but you wanna say something in German just to you? Yeah, gerne, hallo. Ich bin hier in Berlin geboren. Meine Großeltern kommen später. Ähm, ja, die wohnen ja jetzt zehn Minuten weg in Lichtenberg. Ich habe heute Morgen mit denen fix gesprochen. Ähm, aber, ja. Du hast es wirklich hart gemacht. Wow. Vier Jahre German waren ein langer Weg. Josh, was willst du in German sagen? Oh, we don't really want to go there, do we? No. <laughs> but we want to go someplace else because, Josh, okay. I think as much as I know, you've been offered the part of Cable while you were filming Avengers. Yep. Um, what made you say yes to that other anti-hero that you're portraying on the big screen now in Deadpool 2? Money. Yeah. <laughs> lots and lots of money. <laughs> Um, my kids are grown now and I want to travel a lot, you know, I want private planes, I want an entourage, I've never had an entourage, I want an entourage. Um, no, I mean, there was, there was, I was very reticent in the beginning, um, because I had said no to those types of quote-unquote tent films before, and, uh, because I was very happy doing what I was doing. And then uh, Avengers came along, and I liked the fact that it wasn't, not that I'm putting down any of the Avengers, but just an Avenger. It was the big fucking purple dude. And that all the Avengers were trying to kill, and I liked that. I just liked that anomaly. I was a huge fan of the first movie. I thought it was really unique, really irreverent, really inappropriate, and I like inappropriate a lot. Um, never imagining myself. I know that there was a short list, I think, for the last year, a year and a half. I was never on that short list. I never heard about the short list. So I didn't really know that Deadpool 2 was happening. And then they called me over a weekend. And uh, I immediately started to rebel and become reticent. And my wife very sweetly said, why don't you just shut up and read the script? And I did, and I laughed for an hour and a half straight. And within four hours, said, I'm in. And I was also a bit of a fan of this guy over here. <laughs> Questions from the floor, right here in the front row. Deadpool's not a virtuous character. He's not a character that's like Superman or Captain America or something like that. He's a, a bit of a douchebag. And it gives us somewhere to go on, in, the, in these films. It really gives us some place to, to, to sort of play because I think it's more interesting to see somebody that's, that's that's an imperfect person wanting to be a little bit better than they were yesterday, as opposed to just starting as a perfect person and there's nowhere to go. So, uh, so did, yeah, so did, that journey's been a lot of fun. Thank you. 
question over there in the sixth row, and then. Hey guys, uh, Sasha Scholl for Radio NRW. A uh, quick question to all of you: Have you ever been skydiving? And if not, uh, would you still consider doing that after that hilarious scene in the movie? Josh, you've been skydiving. I have. I've been skydiving a yeah? lot. Yeah, you already knew that. You didn't even have to ask me that. I just look like the skydiving type. <laughs> Josh, why don't you chime in? Yeah. Um, I do, but uh, I would love to skydive with Peter. I didn't have the opportunity to skydive with Peter. Peter Peter's, Peter's our my favorite, favorite character. character. Yeah. I love him. I'd say me too. Um, I have gone skydiving before. I, I did uh, f uh, 13 jumps when I was um, 18. On my 13th jump, my shoot failed. So I pulled a, a reserve chute, I got on the ground, burned my pants that I had soiled, and never did it again. <laughs> uh, and I remember the instructor said, you gotta get back up there, you gotta get back up there right now, otherwise you'll never go again. And I went, exactly, fuck face, never again, <laughs> ever. That plane was perfectly fine, and I left it. So yeah, no more skydiving for me. Uh, that was the last time I ever went. Uh, yeah. Hello, this is Marcus, Marcus Cheater. This is a question for Ryan and Josh. Uh, you both have also experiences with the DC comic world. Now mm. you belong to the Marvel comic world. So which one was more successful? Mm, the question <laughs> is, what are the, in, in your eyes, uh, the big differences between these two comic worlds? Total failure and massive success. <laughs> I'm gonna just Ryan? no comment. <laughs> uh, you know, said. You hide behind the mask, you inappropriate. Yeah, twist. that's right. He's got no mask. So, yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a huge difference. To, to, you know, it, it's. I really like DC. I would really like to go back and do my DC movie again if I were ever so rich that I had the money to be able to do it, which I probably won't, so I'll never do that. Um, but I like Jonah Hex. I really, I, I had an intention, kind of like a High Plains Drifter intention, to do it in this gritty kind of Western um, guerrilla way, and I still think that that was the most appropriate version, but who knows, you never know until you manifest something and people react to it, but I think the studio got really nervous um, and you know, you start to put bells and whistles. That's what I love about this movie is there is there is a heart in this movie, and you can invest in the characters. And I think when you can't invest in the characters in any story that cost however much, um, it's uh, I think you lose. And I think uh, that's the wonderful thing about Avengers. It's the wonderful thing about this movie is people start talking about it as if it's real, which is kind of fun. Question right here in the second row. Hello, my name is um, Liliane from Promiflash. Um, you've created such a humorous movie, but what was the funniest um, scene on screen um, that was not put in the movie? That was your favorite? Mm -hmm. That was not put in the movie. Um, that's not in the movie. There's this, there's, we, we cut some of the stuff out of uh, the X Mansion bit. There was a, there was a, a pretty big scene in the, in the X Men kitchen. Where, where Wade has decided that he's gonna replace all the, um, the, the labels in the refrigerator with Velcro, uh, and has a nice little conversation with Colossus and NTW and Yukio. Um, I love that scene so much. It was just, we needed to get to the story a little quicker, so we had to take it out, but it's just such a funny scene. I mean, uh, NTW was played by Brianna Hildebrand, at one point asked me why I'm dressed like a registered sex offender. You know, I have this like woven belt and these pants that are way too high and this, it was just, a, it was a really fun scene, but it's, uh, it'll be in the home entertainment package, but, uh, but I, I missed that scene. I fought hard to get that scene back in, so, yeah. Let's talk about more deleted scenes because we've been already talking about standing up to Ryan and his improvisational comedic uh, talents. Um, what was it like, I mean, was it, more difficult to actually stay serious, Josh and uh, and Zazi. And Josh has Eric. no problem staying serious. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Very intimidating. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I mean, yeah, Brian's really fucking funny. Um, if you can't tell, um, but I, um, I mean, Josh Cable's pretty um, moody, so I don't know what that was like for you. I mean, for me too, I guess. <laughs> but 
But um, yeah, I mean, it, it was, um, you know, if, if people did break, we would just sort of do another take again. Um, but it was also, I think it was just sort of a part of the whole thing to kind of just like run, run through and, and try, to, try to make it through a scene. It was more charming than anything. You know, when you do comedy, there's a, you think when you watch it, which is appropriate, of like, you guys must have had the best time ever. Let's see it again. Let's pay more money to, you know, imagine that again and again. And, you know, I've done a few comedies, Flirting with Disaster, a long time ago with David O. Russell. There was Lily Tomlin and, and Alan Alda and Mary Tyler Moore, and I've never been on such a serious set in my life, and people trying to figure out the better joke and trying to one-up one another and all that. I think the group settings with T.J. Miller and, and you know, all of us together, that was the most fun for them. Not for me, because I was really nervous. He's trying to figure out whether you're funny or not, where you fit in the whole thing. But, you know, Ryan's constantly coming up with other lines, and like Zazie said in the beginning, when you're lost, you lean on Ryan. What should I say? What would Cable say? You know, and Ryan's like, why don't you try this? And you're like, oh, that works. Which is crazy, because you're, you're thinking, I mean, you were like writing for yourself and for everyone else while yeah. just I'm merely a best everything. Really. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, it's a, I, it's a group. I mean, it's like like we said, it's a group effort. It's myself, it's Rhett Reese, Paul Warnick. You know, what mm -hmm. you may not see is that we're Rhett, Paul, and I mm -hmm. kind of huddle up, and we're you know we love we love alts. You know, we love all all jokes and those kinds of things for the movie. So it makes for great entertainment. I think in the in the home entertainment package for these kind of movies because you get to see all the different. Jokes, but I, I, oftentimes I'll write, you know, eight to ten jokes to replace one joke, and we'll just try them all. Um, and it's always fun to sort of share. I love Domino, and I and I and I love Cable. I just I absolutely love and eat and breathe these characters too. So um, it's fun to to work on all that stuff. I mean, you know, Dave Leach is just so great at, at not only accommodating that, but making sure that. Um, that certainly I don't run and leap into an empty swimming pool filled with broken glass, which I have a tendency to do because you can go too far with stuff or you can push it too far. And Dave is very good at sort of seeing the macro where I'll sort of focus on the micro in, the, in these moments. But Josh is also right with, I think, like comedy is very meticulous. Like you have to hit a beat and it has a rhythm and you have to do that visually and, um, you know, with the tone and vocally. And so it can become sort of like a, a, a puzzling, um, a puzzling of tones and a puzzling of beats, um, which, yeah. It's Ryan's little comedic mafia. <laughs> <laughs> the stories are more interesting, they're more human. You know, I, I love this idea that back in the day, tentpole movies were kind of seen as B movies, almost, or a lot of cheese and no real heart and story. And I think Marvel was the kind of beginning, Marvel Studios and Kevin Feige was the beginning of like saying, well, why can't Mark Ruffalo play this? And why can't, so they started pulling in kind of a different echelon of actors and the movies started to, I think the writers reacted to that, you know, and, 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 and audiences reacted to that. You know, they started to really, um, lend themselves to the stories m more than just bells and whistles. People started to, you underestimate the audience and you think they want to see one thing, but really they want to be able to care. And I think with Marvel, you know, and these types of movies, even though this is totally inappropriate and funny, you do care. Like when I saw the movie for the first time, I was like, <laughs> you know, and, and, and I care about Ryan's character and that he's searching for his heart and he wants to get back to his girl and you know what I mean? I picked Deadpool over No Country for an Old Man. What? Day. <laughs> you a rotten liar. Um, I, uh, I, well, I, I also think it's an I think it's an evolution, just because I, I think audiences, to a certain degree, are desensitized to actually the spectacle. You know, spectacle is a computer-generated thing, and um, you know these movies have started to. Make their spectacle character, and that's that's one thing I love about Deadpool is that there's never been the budget to do the world is ending kind of stories. We have to sort of rely on character. The first movie certainly. I mean, I remember the studio took seven million dollars away from our budget 
six weeks before shooting, so we had to do a frantic rewrite, and necessity really is the mother of invention, you know? We, that's where our, in Deadpool 1, there's a sequence where he only has 12 bullets and all of these bad guys to go ahead and sort of, sort of hit some line about, I only have 12 bullets, so you're gonna have to share. And he kind of goes after them, this big sort of sequence, but it was just, it was written that way because we just didn't have the budget to do what we initially intended to do, which would have been much worse. Um, so for Deadpool 2, we sort of made sure we had some of those, those, those ideas in place as well because, you know, the studio wasn't going to give us the Marvel money. You know, we're Fox, we're 20th Century Fox, and they, they don't give anything away, so <laughs> we uh, barely scraped by with what we had, and, um, and, and but that's, that's the best way to make a movie like this, is you just don't have the money to just sort of piss around. You have to, like, really, you know, buckle down and get it right. Ryan's trying to make it sound like Deadpool's an independent film. <laughs> yeah, no country for Deadpool. <laughs> Rated R. Hey, hi, it's Larissa from Valer Magazine. It's a question to all of you guys. So, Domino's character has the superpower luck. How lucky would you guys call yourself? Or was it only hard work that brought you here? Mm. Well, luck is, I don't know, I hear this, is hard work meets opportunity, I guess. So I'd say, I'd say both um, for me. Uh, that being said, the past three years have been quite uh, incredibly wild for my career specifically in terms of the uh, trajectory with which the jobs I managed to get. So I don't know, I don't, I don't know how hard I, I worked for that if I truly was in the right place at the right time. I don't know anything about luck because it's not really a superpower, but uh, <laughs> I, uh, I do know that um, that you know the hard work thing is it. I mean, you know, certainly luck plays a, a, a part, but it's just going to get you a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of the way there. You gotta, you know, I, um, I, I have found that you know in this industry is pretty. I, I notice this is kind of common. You really gotta make your your own stuff, or you gotta put your fingerprint on stuff in order to like really feel not just creatively satisfied, but you know, for I think audiences, I think audiences want authentic connections. And you know, when they see characters that, or actors that are in love with their job or love playing a character, I think it translates through the screen. So, you know, and that's part of that's hard work, I think. Yeah, I think when, when like Ryan's saying that he, I mean, it's gone from eight years to 11 years during this tour, but I think it's 11 years that you were pushing this movie to get done, and having done Green Lantern. Yeah, thanks. I think, uh, I think luck has something to do with it. But then again, if you look at the amount of work that he's put in, and the fact that nobody wanted to do this movie forever, and that he had the confidence, and the wherewithal, and the persistence, until somebody finally said, okay, I think speaks a lot to you know how difficult it can be and on your ego too, of like, no, no thanks. Thanks for coming in. You know, the door's right there kind of thing. And then you just keep doing it and keep doing it. You know, for me, I've been doing it for 34 years. I did the Goonies and then I was in the desert for 20 years and just a working actor and fine with being a working actor. And then a movie comes along and people say, well, what changed? You know, how did you go from doing C minus movies to A movies? And I was like, they were C minus, really? I thought I did well. I thought it's the same acting to me. It was just better filmmaking, and it's a and it's a different reaction from audiences. So you don't know, you don't know how much luck, hard work, but it's definitely a, a rough go. You know, if you're in it long enough, that's inevitable. You know? Thank you. Sorry, we're running out of time, so this is going to be the last question from the gentleman right here. Uh, hello, uh, Thorsten Bretzinger, Alex Radio FM and 60 Minutes. Uh, it would be a question for Mr. Brolin. Um, at the moment, you are present with three different movies at the scene. Um, how do you manage um, to switch mentally between these three parts when you did them? Well, I did five movies over two and a half years back to back. And I'm going away for a while. I'm leaving um, because I'm a little spun. Um, they've come out differently than how I did them, but it just worked out that three movies are coming out, four movies are coming out back to back. The last being Legacy of a Whitetail Deer Hunter um, in July. So 
I, I think it's kind of fun, you know, the fact that they're very different. Even, you know, when you look at Avengers and you look at Deadpool, it's, you know, Deadpool is making fun of the kind of adventure, Avengers experience. Um, Sicario turned out well. So I just think, you know, you want to talk about lucky? This is a lucky moment. It's a fun, very lucky moment that will never happen again. <laughs> People keep telling me that my career is probably about to drop off because uh, it's been going so well, so who knows? Well, you're very, I, I do believe you're lucky out of all of us. <laughs> Thank you so much, Josh, Ryan, and Zazie. Thank you, guys. Coming to Berlin. Thank you. Thank you. All the very best. Thank you. Thank you. We'll open next Thursday, and have a great day. Thank you.